Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hey, John, how are you doing? Good. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. It's good to see you all again. Art, uh, are you as impressed with Stephen Campbell as I am from uh, I our, think, our no, last session with No, him? I think more so. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, you know, what was amazing is that what we learned was only part one of this four part foundational series about how your brain really works and how we can use it, retrain it to uh, to get what we want. So um, I, the best thing I thought out of part one was the end when he gave us two uh, really usable things to talk about when you fail or when you are successful. And if you have, haven't, if you folks watching haven't seen that first video, you need to go back and watch our first video, part one with Stephen R. Campbell. But it's time to move on. Am I right, Art? I think so. So, uh, Stephen, hi. Hi. Thanks for having me back. This <laughs> yeah. is so much fun. Yeah. Good to see you. Stephen, uh, last time you basically explained to us how the brain works. What's next? Yes. What's step yep. two? Well, now we want to talk about a a piece of information that everyone hears and is called the self-image. But I'm going to blast it a little bit before we build because there have been something information about the self-image that have just been incorrect. So uh, let's start with that. Okay. Let's begin with the two most important, well, the most important concept I talked about last time, and that is this, that the primary element that's holding us back from learning, growing, changing, is not what we're facing. It's not COVID. It is not how we were raised. It's what we are saying to ourselves about COVID and what we are saying to ourselves about how we were raised. It's our self-talk. Now, here's some more concepts that we want to get into as we talk about our self-talk. And today we're going to center in on our self-images. Last time we had centered in how we learned today, it's self-images. Let's start with this principle. Our mind will not let us be unlike ourselves. What, what does that mean? I talked to you last time about my being stupid in math, and that's what I thought. And I was because that's what I was saying. And then I discovered I'm really good at math, and my brain said, yes, you are, and I became brilliant in math. Our mind will not let us be unlike ourselves. Let me give you some examples, because I think examples make it really clear in terms of how it works. A gentleman by the name of Stephen Danish got his master's by studying lottery winners. And he wrote a paper which is very, very famous around psychology from Virginia Commonwealth University. Here we hear what he discovered. Lottery winners who won the money, who were very, very poor, what do you think most of them did? Gave it away. Lost it. In fact, here's a gentleman who spent $5 million in two years, and now he lives in a trailer. Another person he studied uh, won $16 million in a 1988 Pennsylvania lottery, and now he's on food stamps. Here's a person who used her winnings for loan, and she could not pay it. Why? Because they didn't see themselves as rich. They saw themselves as poor. And the brain will not let them be unlike what they're saying to themselves. So we don't let ourselves be any better than we believe we are. Remember my story of Susie last time? The man. She said, I am a C student. And yes. she was. That's what we do to ourselves. So what has to change? What has to change are our self-images. But what we're going to learn today is that is really, 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 really hard. If not almost impossible. But I'm going to give you a way to do this. And this is going to be exciting. So let's go with another story. My wife smoked for the first 10 years of our marriage. And every month, January, she would say, okay, honey, this is the year, this is the year, this is the year. And she would quit smoking for a week, a month, and then go back to smoking. The reason she could not quit is because she didn't change how she saw herself up here. She still saw herself as a smoker. And when she quit smoking, her brain said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're a smoker. 
then you smoke. And eventually it caught up and she began smoking again. And then one summer she flew home and watched her father die of emphysema. And I picked her up at the San Francisco airport. She got in the car, looked at me, and she said, Steve, you are looking at a non-smoker. What did she do? She replaced that self-image in her mind of being a smoker to a non-smoker. Now, this is really important to understand. There is still an image in her mind of being a smoker. It's still there. How do I know? Because she never had lobotomy. <laughs> so it's still there. But she chooses not to smoke. And every single time she does, that self-image of a smoker goes farther and farther and farther back in her mind. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay? Here we go. And if your listeners want to maybe write some of this thing down, it's really helpful. Number one, where do our self-images come from? That's the subject today. This is what's so exciting. Do you know where our self-images come from? They come from our self-talk. How easy is that? I love to teach this because it's so simple. Our self-images are coming from what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves all day long. Why? Go back to what we learned last time. Your brain's believing what you're saying to yourself. Your brain believes it. So for 42 years, I'm really dumb in math. The brain said, yes, you really are. And I was. Then I replaced that with I'm really smart. And the brain said, yeah, you really are. Now, I need to be really careful. I happen to be brilliant in math. I didn't know that till I was older. A lot of people are not. So please don't say, well, if you just say it, somehow it magically happens. No, I just discovered something that was already there. So I want to be careful that, that, that we understand that, okay? So our brain believes everything we're telling. Now, I want to do a little sidelight here. What about what others say to us? Listen, John and Art, this is really important. What others say to you do not become a part of you until you agree with them. Did you hear that? As Rose, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, you have to give them permission. What others say do not become a part of you until you agree with them. So let's talk about how our self-images are created, how they come from. And I'll use me as an example. The reason I did not do well in math is because during all my math classes in elementary school, I was drawing dinosaurs instead of listening. So let's say... <laughs> It's a Saturday morning, I'm by myself, I'm nine years old, and I'm drawing a T-Rex, spending an hour on this T-Rex, and I'm really proud of it. So I took it to my sister, Shirley. She's the oldest in our family. She's the expert. She has all her drawings on the refrigerator. And I say, look, Shirley, look, 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 look. And Shirley looks at it, and she says, oh, Stephen, this is really dumb. You can't draw. Now, Shirley has given me opinion, but I've recorded that opinion right here in my brain in what is called a neural cluster, a little teeny one of the cluster here that says, I can't draw. Okay? Okay. That's Shirley. I go back to my room. This time I draw a stegosaurus. And I take it to my sister, Sally, who's a bit younger than Shirley. I say, look, 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 look. Sally says, oh, Stephen, this is really dumb. You can't draw. Sally has given me her opinion, but I've recorded that in our brain. Now, here's what happens. There's Shirley. There's Sally. They're the same thing. So the brain connects them with axons, dendrites, synaptic clefts, dopamine, etc. So they're too connected. You know what the brain's doing? The brain's beginning a pattern. Okay. Well, my mom thinks I can do no wrong. I'm her only son. So at this time, I'll go back to my room and I draw a triceratops. But I want to really impress her this time. So I draw it right on the wall. The paint, <laughs> color, plaster, the whole thing. I'm so excited. I'm done. I run down to the kitchen. Come see, come see, come see. She opens the door. She says, Stephen, what have you 
done. You can't draw. What did she mean Catch on the wall? Mm -hmm. What did I hear? I can't draw. So now there's three. Shirley, Sally, Mom. Watch what happens. They start connecting. And the brain's developing a pattern. I can't draw. So I go to kindergarten. And Mrs. Sykes gets up and says, today, kids, we're going to draw. And I say to Mrs. Sykes, in my mind, in your dreams, because I can't draw. Now, this is all sad, but the rest is, the next is almost, it's disastrous. When I go to bed that night and think about the day, what do I say to myself over and over and over and over and over? I can't draw. And the brain's recording that. In fact, did you know the same place that the brain records what people say to you is the same place that records what you're saying to yourself? It doesn't know the difference. So when I say to myself over and over and over, I can't draw, the brain says you're absolutely right. And that's where we get stuck. Okay? Now, this is what I call the self-talk, self-image cycle. I say I can't draw. Okay? That's what I say to myself. Okay? That self-talk goes to my self-image. I have a very strong self-image of not being able to draw. When I draw something, I look at it and I say, boy, you're really right. And that goes around over and over and over and over and over. I can't draw. Very, very sad. Okay? Now, what do we do with that? That's what we get. We get caught in what is called the comfort zone. The comfort zone, the psychologists, are all those thousands of self-images. You see, we don't have one self-image. We have thousands. Thousands. You have a self-image for how you see yourself as a dancer, as a husband, as a teacher, as a coach, as a uh, uh, speaker. You have all these found self-images, okay? And all of them have been learned just like I learned that I can't draw. Now, here's where we get stuck. And I'll give you another illustration to illustrate this. Let's imagine that I decided to buy a really, really cheap thermostat for our house. And this thermostat is so cheap that when I set it at 70 and the heat goes up to 71, the cooler immediately goes on. If the heat goes up to down to 69, the heater goes on. I get the first bill after the first month and it's huge. So I go by and I more, buy a more expensive thermostat. This time when I set it at 70, the cooler doesn't go on until it hits 75. And the heater doesn't go on until it hits 65. There is a comfort zone there. That comfort zone are our self-images. And the brain's job is to keep you within that comfort zone. Let me illustrate. Let's imagine that I put a big plank in this room. And I say to you, Art, I'm going to pay you $20 to walk across the plank. And the plank is about, oh, 18 inches wide and, and three inches tall. And Art says, great. So he gets up and walks right across the plank, and I give him the $20. And then I say to Art, Art, I will give you $500 if you walk back to this side. And Art says, why in the world are you going to push me off? No, in fact, I'll, I'll sit way over there. What I am going to do is I'm going to raise the plank by 500 feet. <laughs> Now, will Art walk the plank? Of course not. Why? We know we can because he demonstrated that. He won't walk it because what? He's out of his comfort zone. The brain's job is to keep you in your comfort zone. Okay? You heard the thought, you heard the thing, join the army, see the world. I've talked to so many retired men. They say, you know what? We get on the base, we never see the world. We stay on our base to be with our buddies. We just want to stay there. Okay, have you ever walked in the wrong restroom? Boy, you're out of your comfort zone. So what we're going to happen with us in these talks is you're going to begin to grow. Now imagine that there's a rubber band around my palm. 
and you're going to begin to grow. And as you grow, that rubber band is going to stretch because growing is scary. Growing is new. Growing is threatening. So here's what your brain's going to do. It's not going to want to do this. It's going to want to do this. Go back to where you are. And when we begin growing or when we try to grow, we say, well, I'm really, really trying. I used to be a educational dean at a university. And a student came to the office, he would say, I got a C in this course, Mr. Campbell. I don't understand. I'm really, 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 really trying. And whenever I said that, I would put a stapler in front of him and put it on. I'd say, I want you to try and pick up that stapler. And he would pick it up, and I'd say, no, 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 no. Don't pick it up. Try to pick it up. What do you mean? Try to pick it up. So he would grab it again and lift it up and say, no, no, no. Try to pick it up. Try to pick it up. And finally, he would just look at me with great frustration. And I'd say, here's the point. When you say you're trying, your brain says, wonderful. Try the rest of your life. I don't have to do a thing. Remember this, your brain does not want you to change. The brain wants to keep you safe right where you are. So when we say, I'm really trying, the brain says, great, try the rest of your life. I don't have to do a thing. Or when we say, I should lose that weight, the brain says, yeah, you really should. I mean, you probably won't, but you really should. Or I must, or I can. All these things say, yeah, the brain says, absolutely, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So what does work? What does work is saying, I am present tense right there, right now. And the brain says, oh, okay, I believe you. Why? Because you said it. And I believe everything you tell me. That's exciting. Now, here's what gets more exciting. We're now talking about replacing, replacing your self images. We've talked about where they're coming from. Next time we'll talk about how we replace them. So, so Stephen, uh, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Be, no, before you go, John, when uh, Stephen had me walk the plank, he moved over to the left a little bit, thinking that I would fall off and hurt him. So oh. would you would you move to your right a little bit, Stephen, to get back oh, in the frame? Right. Thank you. you walk go. the, walk you the plank back the other way. Right. All right. I, I remember, I didn't go up 500 feet. <laughs> That's right. So, okay. so, Stephen, a question for you. Sure. Uh, all of these, if we have self-images for all of these millions of things that we think yes. about ourselves. Yes, yes. Does one negative self-image and another positive self-image, do they cancel each other out? Are they related somehow? It's or are they all individual? That. Think of your brain as this incredibly wired thing. In fact, the, the scientific community has, has agreed that the human brain is the most complex organism in the universe. So you have all of these wires. In fact, the number of patterns which come from the wiring is based on the number of brain cells that you have. The number oh. of brain cells that you have is right 83 billion. <laughs> the number of patterns is 83 billion to the power of 10,000. Now there's an average, the average cell is connected to 10,000 other cells. That's not a multiple. That's a power. Yeah. So the number of connections is 83 billion to the power of 10,000 and your self images are twisted and, and wired down there. So imagine so they are, some, they, they are perfect. connected yeah, oh, directly yes. or indirectly. They're all connected. They're all connected. They're hardwired. And I'm going to give you a preview from next, from the time when we meet next time, you can't get rid of them. You cannot delete them. They'll always be there. And Ooh. they're really, 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 really hard to change. But here we go. Talk about this next time. You can replace them with new okay. ones because the brain hates to change but it loves to create so when my wife mary retired 
and we drive places. She's always knitting. And I say, who was that for? And she says, I have no idea. But someone <laughs> needs a hat somewhere or someone needs a scarf. Why? Because she loves to create new things. So as I said before, if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. So let's talk about two ways we can use this as I'm done. Number one, remember this. What others say to you, don't become a part of you until you agree with them. The application, quit agreeing. That doesn't mean you have to get in their face. That's between you and you. Or you can say, you know what? That's just not me anymore. Here's a wonderful thing, and we'll learn this next time. Once you become aware of the negative crap you're telling yourself, and we all do this, you can stop it. You can say, wait a minute. No more. That's not a part of the way I think. And what does your brain say? Oh, okay. Is it true? Don't care. All I care is what you tell me. One final story, and then we'll close. I was working. I was leaving because I was also the evening dean, so I would take myself out to dinner, come back, and run the evening school. And the, the reception said, your wife's on the phone. Now, you pick up the phone with Mary, and she'll talk. You get Mary near a phone, and she talks. I picked up the phone, and she was silent. Silent. And finally, I had to say, hi, what's, what's going on? She said, I just walked out of the doctor's office. I have cancer. I need everybody home. So we have two daughters and their husbands, so we all came home and talked and drank and cried and laughed and ate and the whole thing when you're dealing with this. And then eventually the daughters came home, went home that night, and we talked into the evening. Then I came back to my office after Mary went to bed, and I got two books. One, of course, is the Bible. The other one is a book called Learned Optimism by Dr. E.P. Seligman out of the University of, of Pennsylvania. What we learned, and we'll talk about this next time, is that our feelings are primarily coming from what we're saying. And our self-images are really a part of that. So when Mary was recovering from all the things that she was doing, we had some money and she redid her kitchen. And I gave her a plaque. And on the bottom of the plaque, it said, because she said this, I can't have cancer. I'm redoing my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? She had that on the wall for two weeks. Then I came home and it was off. It was missing. I said, what happened to the plaque? She said, you know what, honey? I took it off because that reminded I have cancer and I don't have cancer. Cancer is going to be gone. And it was. So what have we learned today? Our self-images are coming from your self-talk. Most of your self-talk is negative. It's not just anybody. It's a worldwide trait. I wish it was, but it's not. But, but, when you become aware of the negative messages you are giving yourself, you can stop it and say, hey, wait a minute. No longer me. I may have done a dumb thing, but that doesn't mean I'm dumb. I'll do it differently the next time. And when you think this way, the brain says, what? Oh, okay. Is it true? Don't care. All I care is what you tell me. Now, how do we replace those negative self-images? We'll talk about that next time. So let, let me, let me um, uh, share with you, uh, before I knew you, um, something that illustrates what you were talking about today. Uh, from the time I was probably uh, in college uh, through my military, uh, I became a heavy smoker. Uh, I'm talking over three packs a day. Oh, I, wow. I could smoke in the shower, learn to do that uh, in, in the Marine Corps. You, you smoke and then you put it on the top ledge and then you continue what you're doing 
take a puff. So, I mean, I was a serious smoker. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't just a passing three pack a day smoker. And um, I quit several times uh, in my life, uh, a week here, a week there, even once for like a year and a half to two years, never feeling comfortable. And then about 25 years ago, I woke up on a morning, I forgot the exact year, but it was on April 1st, no fooling. And I just woke up this morning, in the morning, and as I said to myself several times, I know smoking is not good for me. I'd like to live longer, probably will short my life significantly. So, you know what? I'm a non-smoker. And from <laughs> that moment, literally within two days, I had no shakes. I had... As a matter of fact, I was a non-smoker. I, I used to travel a lot. I started asking before it was uh, uh, popular. I started asking for non-smoking rooms and non-smoking rental cars because the smoke bothered me. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, when I quit, uh, I would take a commuter railroad and I'd go to the smoking car. And I'd follow people up the subway steps just to yeah. smell the smoke as they lit the crazy. cigarettes. Yeah. But on that April 1st, I woke up that morning, literally, yeah. And I said, I'm a non-smoker. I didn't go through the ritual I of throwing out. Smoker. I am. Cool. A, and from that point on, it's been about 25 years. I'm a non-smoker. Exciting. Isn't that exciting? Do you, have any, do you have any temptation at all to go back to smoking? Zero. And, and zero from about the first day or two, as opposed yeah. to every other time, I never That's stopped exciting. wanting a cigarette. So That is uh, called, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. That is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the term where the brain takes those messages. I am a non-smoker, wires it in. And the more you say it, the more it wires and the more it becomes a part of the way you think. Your brain is constantly rewiring itself. That itself is so very exciting because we say, well, I'm stuck. Well, the reason you're stuck is because that's what you're saying. Okay, well, at, uh, now another example out of my comfort zone, and I can't fix it so far, and I'm, I'm reinforcing it now that I can't fix it, uh, is that I can't carry a tune and I can't remember the words of a song. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't said I am a singer and I can't because <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I, am not a, I am not an artist. I could go to the JC and learn how to draw. But that's not my interest. That's mm -hmm. not my passion. My passion is doing just what I'm doing here. So I'll let someone else. My, my son-in-law is a art director for a com huge computer games company. So I'll let him be the, the artist and so, I'll be something else. So, so uh, uh, we're going to come back with uh, uh, the, the third topic uh, uh, within a week or two. But in the meantime, you do offer a course and you have books or sales. Can you tell people where they can find out about that? Yes. The name of my book is Making Your Mind Magnificent. And it is on Amazon. It is also in a Kindle version if you want that. And the name of my online seminar is Tame Your Mind, Unleash Your Life. It's available on stephenrcampbell.teachable.com. I am offering... A $248 discount. But to get that discount, you need to email me. And I'll give you the code. And you can use that code so that the ending price is only $49. And my email address is Stephen C. S-T-E-V-E-N-C at sbcglobal.net. Perfect. Thank you. Uh... You're welcome. And uh, I'm really looking forward to to the next session. Thank you. The next session this is, is terrific. Stuff. But I'll tell you, the, the next two sessions, are, they just get it better and better and better. You think the first section, oh, how get better? It gets better and better and better. So hard to believe. It, yeah, it is. It's going to next section be really neat. So cool. Thanks. See you again soon. OK, thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our web page, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.